Charles Leandre was born in 1862 into a wealthy family in northwest France, and although his parents wanted him to take up a military career, Charles had other ideas. Throughout his childhood, he demonstrated a remarkable facility for painting and drawing, and at the age of 18, he was accepted at the School of Fine Arts in Paris. And alongside his formal art education, he began creating caricatures for the amusement of fellow students and teaching staff. By 1885, and still only in his early 20s, he was teaching there himself, and simultaneously exhibiting his paintings at the Paris Salon. In the coming years, his reputation in both art and illustration grew rapidly, and by 1900, his work featured regularly in the pages of several newspapers and magazines, including Le Figaro and La Ciette au Beurre. But more than any other publication, it was his long relationship with Le Rire and its wartime incarnation, Le Rire Rouge, which made him a household name in France. The technical quality of his caricatures and satirical cartoons had no equal at the time, and Leandre's refusal to climb aboard the modernist bandwagon led to him being particularly distinctive, with an energetically sketchy but expressive technique which invoked the spirit of earlier French satirical artists such as Dormier and Granville. His work during the Great War pulled no punches, and alongside his scathing caricatures of the Kaiser, he depicted emotionally charged nightmare scenarios populated by monstrous fantasy creations. The only definitive information I can unearth about Leandre's use of media is that he was greatly admired for his use of pastels, and given the textured rendering of his images, that makes sense but there appears to be work created at least partially in pen and ink, and close examination also strongly suggests the use of watercolour. Although best known for his magazine illustration, Leandre ventured into other aspects of printed media, and he produced posters from time to time. He also illustrated works of fiction, such as his visualisation of Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert. But although successful enough at the time, these images looked somewhat insipid compared to the visceral power of his comic output. After the war, the modernists were taking over in both art and illustration, and Leandre would never regain the same level of popularity. Nevertheless, he continued to illustrate and paint at his studio in Montmartre, up to his death in 1934. And the importance of Charles Leandre in the history of satirical illustration can't really be overstated. Russian Vladimir Lebedev is considered by the relatively few who know about him to be one of the most influential children's book illustrators of all time. He was born in St. Petersburg in 1891 and studied art at a couple of colleges in the city. By 1913, he was working as a political caricaturist for the magazine Satyricon, but he was also increasingly creating illustration for children's publishers, and in 1917, his first book, the Arabic folk tale The Lion and the Bull, was published. And it was immediately obvious that stylistically, this constituted a radical departure from the traditional, more representational approach exemplified by Ivan Belibin. 1917 was of course the year of the Russian Revolution, and although many other artists got out as quickly as they could, Lebedev stayed and enthusiastically created propaganda material in support of the new communist regime alongside his work for children. And Lebedev was simultaneously successful as a modernist painter and leading figure of the Russian avant-garde art movement. In 1924, he was rewarded for his work in support of the new regime by being made head of the art studios in the children's book section of the state-owned publishers. This made him an influential figure, not only with his own increasingly radical approach to illustration, but in deciding who else was chosen to create illustrations for the new Soviet generation. His most successful collaborations were with the poet Samuel Marshak, and together they created many popular children's books, such as 1924's The Circus. 
This collection of highly abstracted images and the page layouts created for this book set the standard for the other groundbreaking and influential books they produced throughout the following decade. Like many of the more progressive illustrators, Lebedev approached his use of media with a particularly open mind. In the monochrome work he combined brush and pen drawing with textured effects in crayon and charcoal. And although colour was generally applied flat, in gouache or poster paint, he frequently added stippled tonal effects and even used collage for patterns and textures. But Lebedev's dominance of Soviet children's publishing proved to be shorter lived than expected. In 1929, the communist regime came under the tyrannical rule of Joseph Stalin and it became increasingly intolerant of anything which did not conform to what was called the socialist realism style of painting and writing, which became official state policy in 1934. And in 1936, Lebedev was removed from his influential position with the state publisher, and his illustrations from this point on were forced to become far more naturalistic and representational in order to get published and he spent his later years in relative obscurity up to his death in Leningrad in 1967. Dean Cornwell is yet another American representational illustrator who for reasons unknown is nothing like as well remembered as he should be. He was born in Louisville in 1892 and in his teens he was already working as a cartoonist for the local paper. A couple of years later he was offered similar work at the Chicago Tribune. Naturally he took the job and simultaneously developed his skills at the Art Institute there. In 1915 he moved again to New York and took yet more instruction, this time at the Art Students League, under established illustrator and artist Harvey Dunn, who introduced Cornwell to the work of his former teacher Howard Pyle. This impressed him greatly and it had a lasting impact on his work. And so did the mural painting of respected British artist Frank Brangwyn, with whom he also studied in London. When he returned to the States, the sheer quality of Cornwell's painting made him an immediate success with many popular magazines, including Cosmopolitan, Harper's Bazaar and Good Housekeeping. Most of these commissions were to illustrate fiction by authors such as Pearl S. Buck and Ernest Hemingway, whose stories were frequently serialised in their pages. And throughout the 1930s and 40s, you could hardly leaf through any American magazine without coming upon a Cornwell story illustration or a press advertisement, and frequently both. In the 1930s, he was given the opportunity to demonstrate his ability as a muralist, working for the government arts program and creating complex patriotic murals for public buildings across the United States. And during the Second World War, he created a large volume of dramatic propaganda material, most of it used to boost war bond sales. Of course, as a realist, oils were Cornwell's favoured medium, and in all his years of study, he had learned to use them expressively and convincingly. His compositional skills brought drama and grandeur to a lot of his work, and his painting technique gave greater than usual solidity to his creations. Cornwell's meticulous preparatory drawings revealed the care and precision that went into every stage of his process. And it seems that although he favoured drawing from life as the foundation of a lot of his work, this image shows that he wasn't totally averse to working with photographs, if necessary. In his later career, he continued to paint canvases and murals, but ultimately it was books and magazines which would remain his main area of expression. And whatever the subject, from the Bible to the Wild West, his images were painstakingly researched, drawn and rendered. Cornwell had no problem at all reconciling his commercial work with his art, and unlike some of his more elitist contemporaries, viewed them as equally valid forms of visual expression. But despite his high profile and status in his lifetime, since his death in 1960, he has been largely overlooked and that simply isn't good enough. 
The only biographical information I've been able to find for British illustrator Joyce Mercer is her nationality, date of birth and death. But luckily she fares somewhat better in pictorial terms, so I can at least fill in a few of the gaps. She was born in 1896 and the evidence shows that Mercer was pretty much exclusively an illustrator of children's books. There's no record of where or even if she studied art, but Rachel and the Seven Wonders by Netta Syrett, published in 1919, is the earliest dated collection of her work I can find. And at this point, Mercer's illustration style generally conforms to the prevailing approach of the time largely in the tradition of the watercolourist Rackham and Dulac. But over the coming years, her work became increasingly distinctive as it absorbed the more modernist aspects of the Art Deco movement. Dates of publication are patchy at best, but there was an edition of the Mother Goose classic nursery rhymes by Mercer in 1930, and it's clear how much she had evolved into a confident contemporary illustrator of distinctive and considerable aesthetic appeal. Her work could broadly be described as Art Deco, but it also resonated with the earlier influence of the linear approach of Aubrey Beardsley. The elegant monochromes are of course pen and ink, and the same linear quality fed into the precision of the colour work, generally created in gouache and usually applied flat. She also employed the device of outlining in colour, further enhancing the graphic quality of the work. Among other stories, we know that she illustrated Nathaniel Hawthorne's Greek myth Circe's Palace, and there's evidence of a version of Carlo Collodi's Pinocchio. There's also the story of Robin Hood and even Russian folk tales, but it seems likely that all these were not published as books in their own right, but featured in collections of stories in children's annuals of the 30s. And we know that her decorative images were reprinted and sold as a range of greeting cards for children too. Most memorably, Joyce Mercer illustrated the stories of the brothers Grimm and those of Hans Christian Andersen. The Grimm's volume almost certainly appeared in 1934, and her light colourful illustrations steered these stories into far less gothic territory than they usually brought out in illustrators. Hans Andersen's stories were actually a much better fit for Mercer's fanciful and romantic style. Oddly, there is no record of a publication date for these stories, other than as a joint publication with her Grimm's work in 1936. In the 1940s and 50s, she was one of a select few chosen to illustrate the work of Enid Blyton, who at the time was easily the most popular children's author in Britain. Mercer did her best with the Mr. Medal series of books, but it didn't measure up to her earlier children's classics. But if nothing else, it confirms that Mercer had a career of about 30 years before she died at the age of 69 in 1965 at which point she appears to have become virtually unknown almost immediately. But then that's why I make these videos. See you later, I hope.